And our next talk is Free, Fair, and Fabulous, Five Data Tools to Support Open and Reproducible Research at Your Institution. Great. Uh, great. Thank you, Jen. Sorry, I was just turning on my video. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christine Neiman, and I am the Data Management Librarian from the Network of the National Library of Medicine, Region 1, located in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'm presenting today with Katie Pierce Farrier, the Data Science Strategist from NNLM Region 3 in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and just want to check everyone can see my slides. Yeah? Yeah, they look great. Thanks. Um, in this talk, we'll be briefly going over five freely available data tools that can be used to support open science and open data at your institution. We have a handout to accompany each of these tools that we'll be discussing today. And these product guides will give an overview of the tools, ideas for teaching about these products, and suggested links to learn more about them. Um, we also have an OSF page, so Katie um, will be dropping that link in the chat um, where you can access these guides. Katie or Elizabeth, one of you can drop that in the chat. Thank you. Um, and in case anyone isn't familiar with the NNLM, we wanted to just give a quick overview of who we are and what we do. Um, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, or NNLM, serves as an outreach and engagement arm for the National Library of Medicine. We provide trainings, funding opportunities, and more to a wide variety of organizations to help support our mission of advancing the progress of medicine and improving public health. Um, institutional membership is free of charge, and we offer several free classes and professional development opportunities throughout the year. For more information about the NNLM, please visit nnlm.gov, or you can connect with your region at nnlm.gov slash about slash regions. And thanks, Katie, for those links. Now to get into our talk. Um, so we have, here we have the research data lifecycle, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with already. Um, and open data and open science is something that can occur in every step of the research life cycle. But we pick these tools specifically because start to finish, they support open and reproducible science. So we also wanted to show the life cycle here because while you may not all run out and try all five of these tools today, we hope that you can see at which step each of these tools are used and how they might fit into your workflows. To start, we'll be talking about the DMP tool which is most useful at the planning stage. We'll next talk about the NIH common data elements, which can help with standardizing data at the collection and capture stage. We'll touch on OpenRefine and NL the NLM scrubber, which are cleaning and anonymization tools that can be used as you move into the process and analysis stage. And finally, we have the open science framework. And spoiler, OSF is definitely my favorite. Um, and maybe many of you have already heard of it. Um, OSF has applications for every step of the research lifecycle, but today we'll be focusing on how it helps with publishing, preserving, and potentially reusing data. So in addition um, to wanting to use tools that work throughout the research data lifecycle, we were also intentional in choosing freely available tools that are freely accessible and interoperable with other platforms and applications. Um, it's important to us that the data tools and practices that we're following are consistent with the FAIR data principles. Um, for example, that data and metadata should be easy to find for both humans and computers, um, such as through the use of unique identifiers. Um, the data should be, should, should be easy to retrieve and access. The data should speak to and integrate with other data. And the data should be well described so it can be reused, replicated, and com or combined in different settings. Just want to point out that the R in FAIR can also mean reproducible, which is one of the main goals of open science. And these tools that we're discussing today can also help with data and research reproducibility. So now Katie is going to take us through each of the five tools. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. Uh, so the very first one that we're going to go over is the DMP tool. Um, and again, this is a free tool that helps researchers create data management plans. Um, this is most useful during the planning stage of the research cycle life cycle. Uh, the DMP tool fits in the very start of the cycle because it helps lay the groundwork um, and has you consider how you can make data open and fair before the bulk of the research even happens. Um, more and more funders are requiring data management plans 
the new NIH data management sharing plan goes into effect in January, and the DMP tool has a template specific to the new requirements. Um, researchers can use the template to create well thought out data management plans that meet um, any of the necessary funder requirements. So next slide. So this is going to be a screenshot of the website. Um, anyone can create an account with DMP tool and use it. Um, at the top, you can see uh, where it says NIH-Gen DMSP forthcoming 2023. Um, so this is from the new NIH template uh, that meets the new data sharing, uh, data planning requirements. Um, so the thing I love about DMP tool is that each step you'll see listed here comes with guidance and information. Um, the website will offer definitions, things to consider, and additional resources at every step and every question. Um, so I can't go into every part of the DMP tool today, but the main takeaway is that they have extensive guidance and help tools available. Um, the DMP tool lets you create practice plans. Uh, so this is great for training and outreach purposes. Uh, you can walk someone through a data plan, or you can use it simply to practice and get more familiar with the process. Next, please. Uh, so next, we move on to the NIH CDE repository. This tool is useful in the planning, collection, and reuse stages. Uh, so CDE stands for Common Data Element. Um, a CDE is a standardized, precisely defined question that's paired with specific rules for allowable responses. Uh, this tool is a repository for forms and elements recommended or required for use by NIH institutes and centers. Uh, so using a CDE helps standardize how data is collected, how it's measured, and ultimately how it's recorded. Um, this makes it more interoperable and more reusable. Um, think of all the different ways you could, do, could ask a child what grade they're in, um, or all the different ways you could ask someone if they're a smoker. Uh, the NIH CDE repository helps standardize that data. Uh, so this is, again, this is some screenshots from the website. Um, on the home page, you can search for various data elements, forms, or different questions. Uh, if you look at the top left corner, there's an option to search for NIH endorsed CDEs where the little gold ribbon is. Um, these meet the criteria set by the NIH Scientific Data Council. Um, and so these means that they're high quality computation ready data, um, data elements. And then on the right, I have a list of sample data elements. They're standardized, clear definitions for each of these terms. Uh, that way it's clear what information you're gathering and how you're gathering it. Uh, so if someone comes in after you or wants to reuse your data, there's less confusion about what you mean when you say that they're a current smoker versus what a former smoker is. Um, potential responses for these forms are also given, um, which helps with reproducibility. Um, the same questions are asked with the same potential responses in the same way. Um, so next, then we'll have OpenRefine. Um, and OpenRefine is a very powerful data cleaning tool. This is best used during the process and analyze stages. Um, it's also helpful at the reuse stage if you need to clean or format, uh, format data that you're reusing from another project. One of the most time consuming aspects of research is the data wrangling and data cleaning. Um, and OpenRefine can really help with that. Uh, it started off as actually a Google project, but now it's been taken over by the community. It's a community um, driven project to keep it going. Um, so OpenRefine is secure to use. Uh, it uses a web browser as an interface, but it's not actually connected to the internet. You can clean sensitive or private data securely with it. Um, OpenRefine is also great for version control. You upload your original data file, clean it, and then export a new data file back out. So the original file is preserved um, and unaltered. OpenRefine also helps track all of your, will also track all of the changes that you make to a file. Uh, so if you have multiple files that need the same uh, cleaning steps, you can save those process commands and reuse them um, rather than carrying out each individual step multiple times on multiple files. So this is a screenshot of OpenRefine. Uh, it looks sort of similar to a spreadsheet. Uh, it can work with CSV files, TSV, Excel, and several other different file formats. Uh, it has options to trim leading and trailing white spaces. This is my favorite part. Um, but what I find most useful is the faceting and clustering features that it has. OpenRefine has several powerful algorithms that look for similar phrases or word patterns. Um, it'll cluster them together, and then you can mass edit them to make them all appear the same. Uh, so for example, if someone types in their country and they put US, 
or they put United States of America, or they just put United States, um, or maybe they misspell one of the words. Open Refine looks at all those similar entries, clusters them together, and then you can go back in and mass edit the cells so they all say USA. Um, Open Refine can save time and headaches when it comes to, to data cleaning. Then we have um, NLM Scrubber. This is another tool for the process, um, analyze or reuse stages. Um, it was developed at the Lister Hill National Center for Biomedical Communications or the NCBI. It is a free downloadable tool that can help with anonymizing and de-identifying clinical data. Uh, it can be downloaded directly from the website and run locally without an internet connection. There's no lengthy installation or setup process. Uh, the MLM Scrubber uses a natural language process to find persist, uh, personal identifying information in medical records. Um, and you can use an NLM scrubber to produce HIPAA compliant de-identified health information that's going to be ready for scientific uh, an analysis and reuse. Uh, so here are two screenshots examples of an NLM scrubber. The top is the original patient notes. It has name, age, location. So you can see here that Betty from Cincinnati, Ohio uh, went to the National Cancer Institute. NLM Scrubber uses the natural language processing to find for those personally identifying information um, and replaces it with generic labels in square brackets. Uh, so on the bottom screen, you can see where Betty has been replaced with the generic personal name um, and so forth. The download comes um, with certain terms already in there, uh, but medical records obviously aren't going to be one size fits all. The, NRL, the NLM Scrubber can be customized with other terms and labels. Um, the de-identified data, including electronic medical records, can then be reused for different research projects. And then finally, we have OSF. Um, and like Christine said before, this is a useful for all research lifecycle steps. Um, it's an open science platform that can be used for planning, collaboration, data management, and information sharing. Uh, people can register projects on OSF. You can also use it for conferences like we're, we're doing today. Um, you can document your research procedures. You can find and work with collaborators. Um, you can also share preprints and research data once the project's complete. Um, OSF connects with other tools like cloud servers, citation managers like Zotero or Mendeley. Um, it also works with scholarly identifiers like DataCite. Um, to facilitate more open science at every stage of the research. Um, so it is kind of uh, start to finish helping support open data, fair data, and open science. But with, open, with OSF, you can make your projects private, so only you or your select collaborators can see them. Um, you can make them public if you like, and obviously there's benefits to that, but if your research isn't at that stage or you just don't want to make it public, you don't have to with OSF. Um, we actually created a public OSF page um, on this presentation so everyone can access the slides um, in the handout guides afterwards. And so then this, uh, this is, again, like a screenshot of the OSF registry for the different projects um, that you can find on OSF. So these, this example of these researchers have decided to share information about their hypothesis, their study design, um, and they use OSF to share files and data um, as they work um, into document processes as they go along. Uh, so if and when they decide to publish the, the information from this project, they can add a link to a preprint. Um, they can also share their research data through here, um, or they can link to any of their related publications that come from this project. Uh, so again, this is a public page. Researchers don't have to make their pages public, but they can, they can just use OSF to manage and track collaborations. Um, if they like. So it's a really great communication tool um, an open science tool. So those are the five, uh, five free, fair, and fabulous tools that we wanted to tell you guys about today. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, I'll drop the link to the OSF chat um, again in the, in the chat. Um, you can also scan the QR codes. The product guides will go a little bit more information into each of these projects. Uh, sorry, each of these products and then tell you a little bit more about how to teach them and kind of tailor it to whatever your specific audience is. Um, those are all available on that OSF page. Um, but thank you all for listening. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Christine and Katie. Any questions?
I was furiously taking notes during part of that because I was a aware of some tools, but not all. And that was one of the best explanations I've heard of why Open Refine is so useful. Lots of applause in the chat. Yeah, uh, ditto, Amy. I know I heard about NLM's scrubber tool a while ago, but uh, I don't think I'd heard any more in a long time. And the screenshot example was really clear. I appreciated that. I do want to add with the NLM scrubber, um, they have like a help guide available and they have like a, a, a sample data set that you can, can download with it. Um, so that way you can get in there and kind of use it and figure it out before you actually put your own data, data in there. That's, yeah, that's a great suggestion and almost kind of answers one of the questions that I think just popped up in chat. Um, getting researchers to use a new tool. Um, if you could demo, you know, and how it works on a sample. Any um, other answers to that? Yeah, any of these, a lot of these tools come with, um, in the product guides too, I link to any like the tutorials that are available. And I think framing it as ways that will make it easier for them. Um, these are things, tasks that they're already going to be doing. And these are tools that can help with those workflows and kind of framing it that way. Um, and they're they're free and they're available, so it's not proprietary to whatever organization they're at at this time. So if there's other collaborators at other universities, they're still going to be able to access them. If they go to a different institution, they'll still be able to access it. Um, so kind of framing it that way that it's going to help improve the processes that they're already doing and that it's free and that there's help um, available out there to, to get them started. And two questions popped up in Q&A. Can you guys see those? The first one regards NLM Scrubber. I see the one about the NLM Scrubber regarding de-identification. Um, as with many tools, it's not perfect. So it is still, and um, it is still like the responsibility of the researcher or whoever's using the tool to be sure that the data has been de-identified. Um, like it does a pretty, I, I don't know, Katie, if you have more to say on that. Um, I think, I mean, as you said, you can add fields to it as well. Sorry, you go. Yeah, you can add or take away fields because uh, sometimes like you need the zip codes or you need geologic, geographic information, um, but it's not perfect. Uh, it It is still like a work in progress and ultimately it's the researcher's responsibility to make sure that it's HIPAA compliant. Um, so just kind of keeping that in mind when you when you go through and do it. And then, of course, you know, de-identification is something that's always kind of evolving and just keeping that in mind that for every step that we have to de-identify something, there's a step to re-identify that information, too. So kind of keeping that in mind. And then uh, I can't seem to actually find the text of the questions in the NIH CDE, but I can find the definitions just fine. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean, maybe in the chat or something? With, with NIH, uh, with the CDEs, um, it basically got another example of what it does is like the depression scales or like the pain scales, um, asking somebody um, like what their pain levels are, or when you're asking somebody about um, this is actually a better example. It's like, how many alcoholic drinks do you have a week? Well, there's a lot of different ways to ask somebody about that. Um, and the CDEs will say, here's the standardized question that this research institutes use. Here's the standardized answers that we have people respond to. Um, and so that's kind of what it'll ultimately look like is what's the suggested question that you should ask? What's the suggested responses should be? Um, and then people can kind of select from there, but that way the information's asked the same way, it's recorded the same way, um, sort of that. Oh, okay, some of the CDE content is only available if you make an account with them and log in. Yes, um, it's free to make an account. Uh, it's not like a subscription or anything like that, but to access the full information, you do have to have um, an NCBI account. I think also, I'll just add, Katie, what you were mentioning too. I think um, you can search the forms and that might be maybe what you're looking for, the questions that are used um, that, and then the responses that usually go along with that.
Any additional questions? We've got just a couple more minutes. Okay. Oh, one more from Nina. Yes, I know for sure we have a training session coming up very soon on CBE. I don't remember when, but if you go to nlm.gov slash training, it has all of our uh, training sessions that are coming up. And I'm, I'm almost positive there's one coming up on the CBEs. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. It might have passed, actually. I, I saw one I think last week, but the recording is available. Um, I'll try to find that link. And I believe we might be doing some training with the DMP tool. Um, yeah, that's in the plans. So to do. that's somewhere in the plans, maybe. Um, but so right now, but um, I will find the link for the Common Data MLMs training. I don't know how helpful it was. I put the top level training link from the NNLM uh, website. I know the sessions that they've been doing on preparing for the NIH uh, policy rollout have been really helpful. Yeah. 